Thank you, God, so much for this morning. Thank you for every woman who carved time out of their busy schedules, Lord, to be here today to get a word from you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that the Holy Spirit would stir in their hearts, Lord, would encourage them, and that you would just shine bright in every single one of our lives, Lord, that we would shine bright for Jesus, that we could point others to you as we're walking out the calling that you have given us, Lord. So I pray this time that you would speak, Lord, that you would be greater and that you would make me smaller. And just I pray, Lord, that you would bless these ladies through this teaching. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So good morning. I'm so happy to be with you guys today. Uh, My name is Marilyn. I know Pam introduced me, and this Bible study is such a blessing to me. I left Tampa 10 years ago with my family, and I left a Bible study there that was a deep study of the Word, and uh, it transformed my life, that Bible study. It literally changed my life. And so when we moved down here for a job, I just felt this big hole, like, where am I going to have a study? I was looking at the church I was in and looking at different opportunities, but nothing was quite like that deep study of the Word with this amazing group of women. We were sharpening each other. So I was praying for that, and my husband said, God wants to answer that prayer. He wants that for you, so keep praying. And so I was driving down Flamingo Road, and God gave me a sign, literally a big sign that said, (laughs) Sheridan House Women's Bible Study. And I said, what's that? And so I went right to my computer, and I Googled it, and I had friends that I talked to about it, and they said, oh, that's really popular. It gets filled up fast. I, I watched some of Rosemary's teachings online from the previous session. It was summertime. And I said, oh, I definitely want to be part of this. And so that this has been such a lifeline to me. So I'm super honored and privileged to be here with you guys today and um, sharing this message. So today we are talking about, in Lesson 14, about the treasure we have as a Christian and walking with the Lord. And a few weeks ago we talked about what it looks like in Chapter 4. We were talking about what it looks like to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received And that is hard in our flesh, right? We can't do that without the Lord. And we talked about what it looks like to take off the old, to shed the old, and to put on the new. And in that same vein, we talked about being an imitator last week of God, to mimic God. How do we do that with a clean heart, pure thoughts and actions and words? And so that our very lives are a fragrance to God, right? It's an offering to Him. It's a sweet fragrance. And so these are things, and we're going to go in line with that again today, talking about light and wisdom, but these are things in our flesh that we fail. But in the Lord, this is the only way we can live out this calling. So we're going to start with reading chapter 8. If you want to turn there in your Bibles to me, uh, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 8. And it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. So A in your outline, live as children, uh, A in your outline, we are children of the light. It's already written in there for us. We are children of the light. But the phrase that's most important in that verse is in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. So that's where we go to number one. Jesus is the light. Jesus describes himself dramatically in John chapter 8 in one of the great I am statements. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that's such a powerful picture of Jesus as the light of the world, not the sun, Jesus. And so what does light do? When we think about light, we need light for everything. It is the very essence of life on earth. Without light, There's no warmth, there's no growth, there's no beauty. Light brings all of that to our earth. We can see the the light shining on the ocean in a beautiful day. We see the people are drawn to the sunrise and the sunset. The light is just so beautiful. So not only is it the source of light, it's the source of beauty. But Jesus, if we put Jesus now as him, Jesus is that light. He is all those things. And when we put our faith in him, he fulfills all of that. So in that statement, because he is the light and he is in us, then number two, we are the light. We have that quote from Donald Barnhouse in your outline. He's a great pastor from the past. And the quote says, when Jesus was in the world, 
He was like the shining sun. When the sun sets, the moon comes up. The moon is the picture of believers, the church. But whether the church is a full moon or a thumbnail moon, whether waxing or waning, it reflects the light of Christ. Our light does not originate with us. So we think about that in the idea of like we are just a reflection of him. And last Friday night, my church had a women's event. And this in the not a coincidence, I'm sure the whole topic was about being in the light. And the speaker used the same illustration of the moon. And I thought she did such a beautiful job when she said, this really stuck with me, she said, the moon doesn't try to reflect the light, it just does. It's whether or not the moon is in the right position, right? If the moon is in a certain position, we see a full moon reflecting the beauty of the sun. When it's a new moon, we don't see anything. We see darkness, we don't see any moon. And that's the same with us as believers. When we are positioned, in the Lord, we are reflecting Him. Not because we're going to try harder, we're going to try to be the light. It just happens. As we abide in Him, we reflect Him. And when we're not abiding in Him, we don't. And that, that, that mystery, it's a, one of the great mysteries, is something that as a believer we know is true. We have the Holy Spirit and we shine that light. And we, it says in the Bible that we are going to be literally a light in the future. If you look at Matthew 13, 43, you can just write it down. The, if you want to go check it out later, Jesus is saying the righteous, which is us, we are the righteous because of his righteousness. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. That in eternity, we are actually going to be a part of that light. John 17, when Jesus is speaking to the father, Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me. Wow, Jesus gave us the glory that his father gave him, that they may be one as we are one. So someday we will shine a glorious light beyond description. And knowing that we have a, an obligation for today to be the light today. So a B in your outline is we are the light today. Verse the 8B, that little second part of 8 says, live as children of light. So we are in a dark world and sometimes we can start feeling like the weight and the despair and the gloom and doom of everything we see. If you read the news, everything is negative and we're like fighting for one little piece of light. But we should not be in despair feeling like, oh Lord, what's going on? You know, everything is so dark. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, but he left us here with his Holy Spirit in us. We are the light of the world. And I mean, that phrase, you know, it's, it's in the, in scripture where um, Jesus is saying to his followers, you are the light of the world. And I remember the first time someone said that to me, you know, I was a new believer. I didn't give my life to Christ until I was in my early thirties. And I was through this Bible study for the first time, deeply studying the word. Um, because I was raised Catholic and I had a completely different picture of what it meant to be a good person and, and my idea of my good works and hoping that I had done enough at the end of my life that I would be in heaven, not sh never knowing for sure. And, and then I understood through studying the word, like God supernaturally opened my eyes, all these little connector moments of things I had heard, like the Lamb of, the God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I understand now, Lord, that your sacrifice took away my sins. Like things I had heard growing up finally clicked in a new way in my heart. And um, I, my Bible study teacher, as these like revelations were happening, she would meet with me after and we'd talk. And one day she said, you know, after I had gone through this journey and become a new creation in Christ, she said, Marilyn, you are the light of the world. And I was like, what? I couldn't handle that comment. You know, I thought it was blasphemy. In fact, I'm like, I'm not the light of the world. But she was speaking this promise over me that Jesus says to his believers, you are the light of the world because of my spirit. And I, I, understanding that and knowing that changed everything in my life. And it reminds me of this coffee mug that my husband got from a, one of the pastors here in town in South Florida that he was doing work for and they gave him this coffee mug and it says on the mug, Jesus changes everything. And I love drinking from that mug 
um, because it reminds me of how things were and how things are in every way. When we are in that light, we are transformed. And that's when we're going to talk about the fruit now coming up. How do we live as light? That Holy Spirit, knowing who I am and knowing whose I am, changed everything in my life. I am the light of the world because of Jesus, and I am his, and he is mine. And that changes how I drive in traffic. That changes how I discipline my kids. That changes how I interact with a coworker who is being really mean to me. It changes everything because I know who I am, and I know whose I am. And so that is one of the fruits that come, that part of the fruit that comes from walking um, in the light and walking with the Lord. So we're going to move to verses... Eight, we're going to look at 8b, 8 through 9 and 10. So live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. So when we think about fruit, this is the fruit that naturally occurs when we are walking in the light. And if you think about a fruit tree, which we have so many in South Florida, we don't, um, with the fruit tree is not laboring, you know, to produce that fruit. I think of this one time I decided to take my kids on a nature walk. It was during COVID times and we couldn't do anything else. So I said, oh, let's go to this Broward Park and do a hike. And I'm not a hiking kind of a person, but I was trying to find things for us to do. And this path was such an unclear path as as I'm walking with my kids, I'm like, are we ever going to find our way out of here? Where am I? It's just acres or miles. I have no long, I have no idea how big it was. But I was wandering through this untouched nature and we see this big tree that is just bursting with fruit, like hundreds of pieces of fruit on that tree. And the branches were really high. And I don't think they were limes, but we just needed to try to grab one of those. Probably illegal. I don't know if that's okay to say it to touch those trees. It's probably not allowed. But we were trying to grab a piece of fruit and um, climbing on each other's shoulders and we couldn't reach the fruit. But I thought to myself about this picture. There's nobody manicuring that area. Nobody has put fertilizer there. No one is walking with a water hose making sure that that particular tree is getting water. But that tree was bursting with fruit. And that is a picture of us. When we are in the right soil and we are receiving the sun, we just, the fruit just bursts forth. If not in my effort that I'm trying to be generous and I'm trying to be truthful, it just flows from walking with the Lord. So number one is goodness. That's one of the fruits that we will produce, goodness. The closest translation that we have of that word goodness is generosity from the original language. So if we are in the light, we are called to be generous of our time and generous with our finances, generous with everything that we've been given. And we see time and time again how God uses that generosity to bless the recipient, but also to bless the giver. We can, so many stories that Rosemary has shared with Sheridan House where there's a single mom and she has no vehicle because her tires have gone and the group comes together and prays and literally, miraculously, a man pulls up and says, do you guys need tires? Like, the God is just using one person to bless another person, but the giver is being blessed even more than the person who receives. And that generosity, God wants our heart, not so much our money, not so much our, uh, I need her to serve in kidsmen, because without her serving, the whole pro process is going to collapse. He doesn't need me for kidsmen. He wants my heart. He doesn't need my $500 for this charity. He wants my heart. And so as we, and that's one of the things, especially with money all over the Bible that we cling to, we find our security in, we find our safety in, we're going to save enough for retirement, or we're going to, you know, buy all these things so that we can have a good life and experiences for our family. And it's like we, we cling so tightly sometimes to money when we know that in a second it can be gone. And if that's where our safety is and that's where our security is, it's going to be a dark place for you. But when our security is in him and we're walking in the light, we can open up our hands and say, it's all yours, Lord. You gave it to me. Where do you want me to give it back? And, and that act of submission you know, with our money is how we, we naturally will produce that fruit when we're walking in the light. 
The same with our time as uh, probably all of you busy women, our schedules from when our eyes open to when they close are stack, 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 stack with things to do. We are running around. And are we able to be generous with our time for the Lord or have we left no room for him? I remember my husband when he was reading this Christian book as part of his um, curriculum. He was in seminary at the time and it was called Margin. And it was so interesting to me because I hadn't really thought about it, but the author was talking about margin on a piece of paper. You know how when you do a printout, you put one inch margins or maybe a traditional piece of loose leaf, you know, it has the margins already there. Well, do we have that margin in our day? Because if you don't, there's no room to write extra little notes in the corner. If you've used every single square inch of that paper for your agenda, where is the Lord going to put his will into your day? And so can we be generous with our time? I want to be able to say, like Samuel, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. But can I really say that when I'm not listening because I've got my own things to do today, Lord? So this is like a call of something that will flow from you as we walk in the Lord. And we make room for him. We can be generous with our time. Number two is righteousness. Another fruit that will flow from being in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness having integrity, and it's not our own righteousness. Remember, we are, our good deeds are filthy rags. It is his righteousness that covers us. And when we are walking in that knowledge, it changes how we interact with society. We walk with integrity. Every business deal, every tax return I have to file, every conversation I have with someone, I'm doing the right thing, not because I'm trying to be a good person, but because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and His righteousness is speaking through me. And finally, number three, truth. Truth, which means the absence of falsehood and deception. And this is so important as a believer and someone walking in the light because Jesus described Satan in John 8, 44. He says he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Wow. Okay, his native language is lies. Have you ever heard that phrase, oh, she's speaking my language, you know, like we're on the same page? I do not want to speak his language. I don't want to speak that. We have to be as Christians. Oh, Lord, help us. In our own flesh, we're going to fail. But in Christ, Help me to be meticulous with my truth. You know, not to exaggerate because of my insecurities or my self-esteem issues, not to omit because of fear or self-preservation, but to be, Lord, give me 100% honesty. Give me the courage. And that's not our nature. If anybody has raised a child, you know, even at two years old, you're like, did you take that second lollipop? And they're saying no. And it's in their hand, by the way. You can see it. And they're like, No. Nobody taught them that. That is our nature to try to self-preserve and lie and omit. And the devil's so good at getting us to rationalize. Well, you don't want to tell them the truth. That might hurt their feelings. And you're really trying to protect yourself. So the devil has all these ways to try to get us to step away from 100% truth. And that's, you know, giving him a foothold. So when we are walking in the light of the Lord, the Holy Spirit only speaks truth. And so I just pray that we don't even give the devil not even one little inch in there of one way he can say, yes, she's on my side, at least for right now, for that moment. So how do we do that? We need to be empowered. We talk about absorbing Jesus, being in his presence, and um, that light is what gives us our light. And Jesus empowers us for all of these fruits. And it reminds me of a time that I bought for my kids, these little glow-in-the-dark stars. They're like plastic, and you're supposed to put them on the ceiling. I don't know if anyone has ever purchased those. Okay, so you're shaking your head. So we get the box. It's in an Amazon box. You open it. We run to the bathroom to see them glow in the dark. They shut the door. It's the only door. There's no light. So it's pitch black bathroom. They didn't glow. We're like, oh, what's wrong with this? So we go. We read the box. You have to put the stars under the light for a certain number of hours. And after they've absorbed the light, then they'll glow in the dark. And so we did it all day on the kitchen table, soaking in all that light. And then at night, we stuck them on there. And sure enough, they were glowing in the dark. And that is, to me, such a picture of us as well. Because if we're in the dark, we're not going to shine light to anyone. 
but when we sit in the sun, right, in the sun of God, when we're sitting and absorbing that light, then we're going to glow in the dark. We're going to glow to all these people that don't know him. It, it reminds me of my husband because he and I both kind of went through this journey together in our early 30s. We had already been married for seven years. And um, through studying the word and prayer and a, mir a miracle, right, supernatural, the Lord opened our eyes to so many things that we were, we were just not walking with him. Even though he was also raised in the church, he was raised in a Christian church, but our lives didn't line up with our faith. They were kind of parallel. I have my faith, but then I also have the music that I like to listen to and the words that I like to use in my industry and it's all guys, so who cares? We're just gonna, I just didn't see the hypocrisy of so many different things. I could go on and on of ways that my life wasn't reconciled with being a believer, but I didn't see it. Through God's goodness, he opened our eyes, he brought us in, he made us new. And I say us, it happened at different times, me and then a few months later him, but um, he and I are lawyers and we work together in the same firm. And the next day after my husband had his born again moment, because for him it was just like very, before and after. And his business partner is an atheist, and she said, what is different about Mike? His eyes are different. There is a light in him. She said that, not me. There's a life, she said life, there's a life in his eyes that he didn't have before. And this is someone who does not believe one word of this. And so that to me was such a beautiful picture because the world sees it. And he didn't like say, oh, I'm going to try to be nicer at work to everybody. I'm going to try. No, we tried on our own in our 20s again and again and failed. But it wasn't until that moment that in God's goodness, he opened our eyes that we were made new. And even the world who doesn't believe in this can see there's something about that person. And so we need to abide in him and, and soak that in so that we can go forward and be the light. So be as we need to abide and shine our light in that dark world. What does that look like to, in your life, abiding in the Lord? We want to know him, and we do that by reading his word, not as a chore or a checklist, like, oh, I'm such a bad Christian. I didn't have my Bible time today. I haven't you know, read the Bible in a year you know, I, I fail in all these ways. No, that is what the world says. But how do we abide and just be in his presence? Reading the word, that's how I want to know him. Praying, it's how I talk to him. It's not a checklist. You know, I want to just spend time with him. It could be holding a baby in a rocking chair. It could be serving in kids, man. It could be praising the Lord at church, hearing the music, or alone in your car, blasting that song that's just speaking to your heart. There's so many ways that we abide in the Lord but that's how we are then empowered to go shine his light into the world. And we see in Exodus 34, you guys probably know the story about when Moses comes down with the tablets. And there's many times in the Old Testament in the Bible where they talk about God's glory shining through people. And they talk about the Shekinah glory. And in this instant, Moses comes down and um, he, he looks different. It says his face shone because he had spoken with the Lord. And Aaron and all the Israelites, when they saw Moses, it said, behold, his face is shining. And they were afraid to approach him because of what they saw. And that's not just a story for the Old Testament. He literally can shine his glory through us today in how whatever sphere the Lord has put you in. That's our prayer, that if we wanna shine, that's that verse we have, that little quote at the bottom, an unknown, if you want to shine in the night, we have to keep in the light of Jesus. So if we go to the next page, we go to see in the outline, how do we as light deal with darkness? So let's keep reading. I'm going to read in the next few verses here. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. So what are we supposed to do? How do we as light deal with darkness? Number one, we need to reject darkness. Reject the deeds of darkness. So dark deeds, as we know, can be alluring. They don't always look like a dark deed. You know, we I think about the... C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia, 
And in the, that one, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe where the queen of Narnia comes and she's the white queen on this like beautiful carriage. And she's got silver and white and a crown and she has this nice robe. And Edmund is coming through the forest. I don't know if you guys have seen Edmund's coming through the forest. He's disgruntled. His siblings are being rude to him <coughs> and he's hungry. And so she says, come sit over here, this beautiful queen. And she's like, oh, this is nice. And he sits down and she's like, what do you want? She has this little magic box. What do you want? And he's like, w would you like something to eat? And he asks for Turkish delight and she gives him a little piece and he eats and he's so happy. And then she shuts the box. She says, you'll have to come back for more, but bring your siblings. And that's like, that's like the enemy. He wants to say, oh, come over here. Look at this. This looks so nice, doesn't it? There's something good, something alluring, something exciting. And then he takes you a little further than you wanted to go. And then a little further and then a little further to be like, how did I even get here? And so we need to reject that deed of darkness and pray for discernment that we can see it because it's not always visible when something is wrong. You know, we, I, I hear stories, um, and again, no judgment because without Jesus, we're all sinners. But stories of like a spouse maybe that's feeling unheard and unloved and they see someone over here that's laughing at their jokes and they complimented them on their outfit. And it seems like I'm always feeling happy when I'm with this person. That's what Satan wants you to do. Look over here, this looks better. This makes you feel good. And then before you know it, you're in a place that you never thought you would be. And so our prayer when we're walking with the Lord is to help us reject that and give us discernment, Lord, for those things that are gonna pull us in a direction that's away from you. Uh, so number two, we also have to expose the darkness when we see it. And this reminds me of a story of in 2008, I was not saved at that point. I had not understood God's grace and, and how he had died for me. And I was watching this show, Oprah Winfrey, maybe you guys remember that show. And they had this whole episode on something called The Secret. The Secret was this video about how to, it took over the world at that point, in the United States anyway. It was this video that, at least if you were not following Jesus, you were watching this video. And I watched it. And it was all about putting good things out into the world. You put a good vision out there, and that's going to come back to you. If you put a bad vision, it, that's coming back to you. And they talked about visualizing your mailbox, and there are no bills in there. There's <laughs> checks, you know? And you make a, it's, it's funny to think about, and a, and a vision board, you know, where you put on this vision board all these things. It's like this <coughs> subtle little, you know, new age stuff. But I listened to it, and I remember going to my husband, and I said, do you think that I can follow the secret and still follow Jesus? Can I like, can these work together? Because we're talking about positive thoughts and good things and Jesus is good and can I have both? And, and he very gently and respectfully and lovingly said, no, no, you can't. <laughs> that is not, you can't surrender your life to Jesus and his plan and at the same time be like, I'm wishing for this and I'm putting this in the universe to come back to me. Like they don't go together. And it's comical to even think that I considered it. But that's where we are apart from the Lord. We're looking and we're seeking and we're like, is this it? Is this it? How am I going to find that joy in my life or that, that hole that I feel? How am I going to fill it? And so that's what the way, you know, we have tons of, if you go to the bookstore that still exists, tons of books of New Age. The world is calling us in a different direction from Jesus. And so when we are in relationship with someone, we can lovingly, A, honesty, with honesty and with grace, point them to Jesus, expose the sin for what it is, not to be tolerating it and saying, yeah, you can do that, sure, because we want so much to be liked that we're going to say it's fine. No, we need to be honest, but with grace to expose sin when the Holy Spirit has put it on our hearts to expose that. If someone comes to you and says, what do you think about this? To be bold in the name of Jesus, to call it for what it is, but in love. You know, point every, always just pointing to the Lord. We're not supposed to go to everybody in my work and say, that sin and that sin, and I'm exposing your sin because Paul says I have to do this, so I'm exposing all of you. That's not what the call is. The call is as the Holy Spirit puts, it, puts those people in our sphere, and opens up the door to expose it with love and with grace and with honesty. So what is the blessing for the light? So as we walk in this light, we will be blessed. It says, I'm going to read verse 14. It says, 
Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So as we do these things, right, as we walk in the light, we are like we awaken and he shines his light on us. And the more he shines his light on us, the more we rise and shine again. And it's like this vicious cycle, but not a downward cycle. It's a beautiful upward cycle where we become more and more like Jesus until we're in heaven. That process, the like biblical term is sanctification. We become more and more like Jesus. We shine brighter and we shine brighter. Not to say that we're ever going to be perfect because we're still in the flesh. You know, there's that, that flesh and that spirit, and they're both here on earth until we're in heaven, and that's when we'll be perfect like Jesus. But we, we pray that the spirit shines brighter, and I am less, right, as I grow more and more like him. So part of this walking in the light then leads to us living in wisdom. So that's A, or we're talking living in wisdom. A, we need to have wisdom with our time. So in what way? So let me read that verse. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. When we think about that with our time, we think, we've got a lot of time. I've got in my mind, maybe so many years or days or whatever I think in, in my mind, but it says in the Bible that our life is nothing but a vapor. Mm-hmm. If you think about that, imagine I have a little handheld mirror in my hand and I breathe on it and a little fog appears and then it's gone. That is what the Lord describes our life, like a vapor. And so we think, oh, I've got time, but, but really the days are evil. They're short, they're gone before you know it, and left in our own flesh we're not going to use the time to glorify god we use the time to glorify ourselves that's our that's our flesh me what do i want what's my agenda what do i think my life should look like what is the world saying my family should look like and what is the world saying any anything wherever you are my career my home my anything am i letting that speak into how i live my days or am i sitting before the lord saying lord how do i use this time there's only a certain number of minutes And how am I using it to point to you? It says in here um, to make the most of every opportunity. In some translations, it says to redeem the time, to buy back the time, right? Because the enemy is trying to get us to look everywhere else other than Jesus. What is your will? So we need to be purposeful and intentional through the grace of God. He will help us to make our days his days. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a righteous man are established by the Lord. So am I praying, Lord, you use me? Or am I just doing my own thing? You know, like, Lord, I want to be available to you. Um, I don't think I shared this with you guys. I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but my daughter in sixth grade has this amazing Bible teacher. And every day she's coming home with like a new truth that she's learned in school. And um, it's so good. I'm just in awe of what God's doing in her life through this teacher who he's working through. And then my husband and I are like, that's good. You know, we're just impressed with all of these things I'm learning from the the sixth grade teacher. And one of the things he said last week was, his name is Mr. Bond. A shout out to Mr. Bond if you guys uh, know him at CCA. He said, God isn't concerned with your ability. He's concerned with your availability. I was like, that's so good and so convicting, Lord. Am I available? Am I using my time for you? comes back to that same thing. It's like it was hard in Paul's day. It feels even harder today, even though we have all these conveniences. But the Lord called us for such a time as this to make the space for him. I love this ver- uh, this song. Kat, there's so many songs, you know, that I know that the Lord speaks to us through music and praise, worship, and music. But Casting Crowns, you know the song, Only Jesus? Mm-hmm. You guys know, I love that song. Well, the, the song starts out with, um, make a mark, leave a name for yourself. And it's talking about the world saying to have this legacy that you leave behind. And it's just a beautiful song. If you haven't heard it, it's good. You should listen to it. But one line that always gets me, it says, I've only got one life to live. How did every second point to him? Mm-hmm. Only Jesus. And so that to me, like, wow, Lord, not a burden, not in a burdensome way. Like, I'm failing. This hour did not point to the Lord. You know, it's not that kind of a, 
oppression. It is a joy. Lord, how can my life point to you? In fact, it takes off the burdens of the world because the world says you got to do this, this, this. This is what a good life looks like, and it gives you a list of things we could never accomplish. But Jesus says it's just about pointing people to me and showing them the truth so they can have salvation, they can have eternity with the Lord. Um, when we talk about making the most of every opportunity, one of the ways that the Lord really uses us in our walk is through our suffering and our crisis, our tragedy. That's one time where everyone is looking at you and everyone is coming up to you. And even if they're not a believer, they're saying, my thoughts and prayers are with you. You know that you have a platform in your suffering to point to the Lord. And I know that so many of you have walked through unimaginable things and have used that to point the glory to God. And that's only through the Holy Spirit. Like I know one of our sisters here who is walking through a, a hardship that we couldn't even imagine. And in their grief, they share the gospel to people who don't know him. And that is a platform. Making the most of every opportunity, that's what that is. Yeah. Everybody that knows that person through this community app, I read that and I was like, wow, I am in awe. This lady is broken. And instead of being angry, she's pointing strangers to Jesus. So when I read that, I was just thanking God for her faith because we don't know why God calls us to have some of us to have really hard journeys, but we know that he uses it for good when we sit and allow him to. So thank you, God, for this sister of mine who is just such a beautiful picture of Jesus. So as we move forward, how do we do that, right? It says not to be, um, not to live as unwise, but to understand what the Lord, what the will of the Lord is. What is your will, Lord? That's the whole goal of our life. What is your will, Lord? Let that be done, not my own. And it's so easy for the enemy to like take a good gift that the Lord has given us and pervert it, you know? And I think in my life, because I'm in this stage where I have young kids and my life is all about the kids, um, you know, it's all about the Lord. But on the daily basis, it looks like it's all about the kids and the food, the lunches and the dinners and the driving to this thing and driving to that thing. And have I done enough? Am I doing enough so that when they leave, this is what I'm thinking of. Did they have enough sports? Did they have enough musical instruments? Do they have enough social interaction? Have, they, have I given them enough encouragement with their academics so that they can go be some amazing career? That is what my days sometimes look like. Not that any of those things are bad, but that shouldn't be what's driving my day. My day should be, what do you want me to do with these children, Lord? How am I supposed to shine their light? Or am I running myself ragged, trying to meet the expectations of the world of what I should be doing with my kids? Because it's not 100% verbatim, my, my play-by-play -play for raising kids in here. I mean, they give us, this is in the instruction manual for life, but it doesn't say one sport and one instrument per child or <laughs> eternal damnation, you know? <laughs> That's just not in there. I have to figure it out. And how do I do that? The Holy Spirit, by sitting with him, will guide what it looks like for my family. And it's going to be different for someone else's family. There's no judgment in however we do it. But it's, I can't be what the world is putting on me. It's what are you putting on my heart, Lord, for my family. That my purpose is only one thing. It's to bring glory to God and to show that to my children. And so I have to just put off what the world is trying to say and put on Christ as I raise my, my kids with my husband. In 18 to 21, this last little section, um, it goes together, even though in many translations are separate sentences. You know, there's a period there and a number of sentences, but in the original Greek, the way Paul wrote it, he wrote it with a different verbs. I'm gonna read the New King James Version for you guys that has a more close reading of how it was actually written because it all goes together with the drinking the wine and the speaking the songs and stuff. It says, do, so I'm going to actually, let me just read the New King James Version. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, versions say debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all the things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in fear of God. So we have, don't be drunk, 
but be filled with the Spirit, speaking those songs, giving thanks, and submitting to one another, all as one thought. And so when we think about being drunk and what a drunk person looks like and that impact that, that the excess of alcohol will have on your body, it takes over your faculties. Your words are not your own when you're drunk. Your body movements, that's why a policeman will say, walk that line, walk a straight line. You can't do that. You've lost control of your body. Your emotions, everything is not the same when you are under the influence of alcohol to that extent. And so Paul is saying, don't be drunk on that. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit take over how you talk. Let the Holy Spirit take over how your actions and your the way you walk and the way. And so he's saying, speaking to one another in song, you are just so filled with the Spirit that you're just bursting with song, inner song in your heart. Um, song, obviously, as we worship the Lord through music in church, in our car, and anywhere we're in our homes, but just an inner lack of control because of the Holy Spirit. So it's that picture of, oh, debauchery. We don't want to go there. We want to be filled with something better. I love how Paul, this is Paul again writing in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. You see how Paul says we were given the spirit to drink and now we connect it with don't be drunk on wine. He's saying, be drunk on the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to be blasphemous saying it that way. We're saying like, be intoxicated with that and that will change everything else that flows from you. You don't even have the control. The Holy Spirit is in control because you've given over everything to the Spirit as He's working in you. So fullness and communication, that's our number one on the outline as we are just filled with that inner song. So many places in the Bible it points to people singing when there's this amazing victory or revelation or even in sorrow singing all over to the Lord and we see it in with um, Miriam when they cross the Red Sea and she looks back and the Egyptians are just being swallowed by the Red Sea and she's like the Lord saved us and she breaks out into song and that's like a picture of our heart we're just so full of the spirit that we are just cannot contain it Fullness and Thanksgiving. I have a story. I'm going to be as brief as I can with the story, but my daughter was, uh, I have four kids. My oldest is a boy and my next year are girls. And when my second child was born, she uh, was born with a rare heart defect. And she was born with only half of her heart. It's a, one of the most severe heart things you could have. And so when she was born, it was very stressful. My husband and I were... Um, Spiritually, emotionally, financially, at the end, we were just beyond and stretched. And when she was born, I was not walking with the Lord. I had not fully surrendered, but you wouldn't know because I was at church and I was in a Bible study. But I know now I wasn't. At the time, I believed I was. But I was really destroyed watching my daughter go through all this suffering there was an open heart surgery at seven days old and she you know if you know about those kind of surgeries they take your lungs and heart off they put it on some bypass machine ten hours later they put it back on so we had all these talks about her percentage of how many days she was gonna live and then the percentage of living to kindergarten and all of these these conversations and I was just a wreck and I remember one particular thing I was like so much pieces of bad news along the way because she was in the hospital for months in the ICU and I remember uh, after the surgery, they leave the chest cavity open. Maybe you know this, you medical people, they leave it open so that the organs swell after surgery and they have to leave time for the swelling to go down because if they close the chest cavity, then all the, the heart function drops. So like she was there with a open right into her chest, I could see and a little piece of plastic, like saran wrap is what it looks like covering her. And I was like dying of pain because of what pain I thought she was in you know like little babies are supposed to be in a soft blanket they're supposed to be cradled by their mom this girl didn't even know who I was because she was alone in this isolate and it was so limited how much time I could see her. I couldn't touch her a needle in every single part of her body I'm not kidding and the excruciating pain and I was like so angry and so the doctor said okay well they closed her and then all her numbers dropped so they had to reopen her and I was like, 
you know, just again, feeling that like they had just cut me in half times 10. Maybe this is your child, you're just dying for them. And so they said, okay, we're gonna try again on Sunday night. So for three days, no other thought was in my mind except, please let it work, please let it work, please let it work, please let it work, please let it work. I just said it so many times. I remember saying, okay, it says in the Bible, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain, please Lord, please, I have the faith. And, then, and I prayed and prayed and prayed until probably till the end of the story on Sunday night, they closed her again and all her numbers dropped and they had to reopen her again. And I was so mad at God. I walked out of the ICU and right when you exit, immediately to the left, there's this little door. And I had seen before, there's a tiny little chapel. It's the size of a walk-in closet and a little bench to pray and some pamphlets and candles. Well, I walked out of that ICU. I went straight to that room and I shut the door and I screamed at the top of my lungs, angry scream, until there was no breath left in me. And then I started to cry and I was like, I am done, Lord. You're going to do what you're going to do anyway, so why am I even praying? You've got your agenda. I'm not talking to you anymore. So that was me in the flesh. You know, I was broken and um, angry because he didn't do what I wanted in my timeline with my child. And so I was not having it. And so thankfully, God didn't leave me there. Over a period of years, he and she had more heart surgeries. She had three heart surgeries. Um, she, he showed me his love. He showed me what it meant to surrender to him. And so my life was being transformed through my brokenness. And he met me there. Thank you, God. He doesn't leave us where we are. He meets us in our hurting. Hallelujah. And yes, praise the Lord. And um, so going up to her third heart surgery, she had just turned three years old. And I had another baby at that time. And we had five, so it was five of us, our three kids at that point. And I remember being a new person in Christ, but I still reverted back into that, please, Lord, don't take her. Because for this third surgery, we had to have this thing talked about the percentages of her living and surviving this. She couldn't survive without it, but she might not survive because of this surgery. So I was just, again, reverting back in my fear, in my anxiety, every kind of negotiation you can have with the Lord. Please, Lord, don't take her. Please, Lord, don't take her. I'll do anything else. You do, you know, trying all these deals I'm trying to work out with the creator of the universe, you know. I had not learned. But on a Sunday before her surgery, I was by myself praying. And, and leading up to that week, I was like fear was the number one thing at that point in my mind. And every time I went to the park with the kids, this is the last time I'm going to go to the park with my three kids. I'll go to dinner with my family. This is the last time the five of us are going to have a meal together, going to church. So you can see, like, this is like not, this is self destructive thoughts here. And um, I remember that day before church, I was praying alone. And I don't know why or how God gave me the strength, but I finally, finally said, Lord, if it is your will to take her, so be it. Let your will be done. But just know that I am going to be a pile on the floor. I will not be able to stand. And every single step, you're going to have to be on either side of me because I'm not going to be able to walk. But let, let your will be done. And I finally surrendered the one thing that I hadn't let go, my child. And I just, you know, I understood at that moment what it meant to have freedom in Christ. Because that's it. I have nothing left. You have it all. Every gift is for, from him and every gift is for him. And so she was his. And so thankfully, Jesus did not take my daughter in that surgery. But when I went in, I had no tears. I had no fear. I had that kind of peace that you read about in Philippians 4, 6, that says the peace of God will transcend all understanding, guarding your heart and your mind. I had it only by the grace of God. It was supernatural. And um, I know that through that hard suffering, I could give thanks to the Lord because my life was changed. My husband's life was changed. It created a ripple effect in my family, my siblings, his siblings, my parents, his parents. I could go on and on. It was like you drop a, pond, a rock in a pond and then the ripple goes out so wide. That suffering in, in my sweet girl's life changed so many people. So I was 
you know, after that surgery, I was driving to Bible study. We lived in Clearwater, Florida at that time, and my Bible study was in Tampa, driving over the bridge, this beautiful water, and I watched the sun rise, and I just had this moment of immense gratitude for Jesus giving my daughter her perfect heart. It's not a defect. That's what the world will call it. But he knit her together in my womb with exactly that heart because he had plans that are exceedingly abundantly more than I could imagine. So it feels like the hardest walk at times in the Holy Spirit we can give thanks because we know he's working. And sometimes we'll get to see it and sometimes we won't, but we give thanks only because of him. Because in my flesh, I'm screaming like a lunatic in a chapel. Thank goodness I wasn't Baker acted, I say, because they were like, what's going on in there? But in the spirit, I am able to say, thank you, Lord, for the hardest thing I've had to walk. And I know it's nothing compared to what some of you have had to walk and are walking right now. So in our thankfulness, we are able to submit, right? We are submitting because we're filled with the spirit, fullness and submission first to Jesus. It's his plan, not mine. So I submit to Jesus. And then just as Jesus washed the feet of the disciples the night before he was crucified, how God came into the flesh. And then not only that, he humbled himself to wash everyone's feet. And he says, I do this as an example. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. So we submit to Jesus and then we submit to others. And we do it joyfully because we know that he loves us. And when we serve others, it is a blessing to us. So this is the treasure we possess when we have the, the beauty and the, the just blessing of walking in the light. So to summarize the treasures that we possess, we are commanded to live as children of light. Will we make wise use of our time or will we be filled with incredible busyness? Are we going to fill ourselves with wine or whatever your distraction is that's going to control your days? Or are we going to be filled with the Lord so that we will be speaking to him in inner song? We will be giving thanks in the hardest of walks that we will be submitting to his plan and submitting to others as we serve them. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, for the beautiful love that you give us that we could never, ever deserve. That you don't leave us in our hard places, Lord, that you walk with us and you show us your love. Lord, that we know who we are and we know whose we are, that we are not alone, Lord. So we thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, for each woman in this room that they would just shine the light of the Lord in every sphere that you have put them in. Let us have your gentleness. Let us have your goodness. Let us have your righteousness. Let us have your truth in how we live out our lives, Lord. And may all the glory go to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.